Hi, my name is Alex Williams, founder of The New Stack, and you're listening to The New Stack Analyst Podcast, a show about application development and management at scale. Thanks for joining us. Hi, this is Lee Calcote with The New Stack. Um, we're here at uh, ChefConf in, in Austin. I'm joined by um, a number of guests this afternoon, um, so just very tickled to have you guys on. Um, do, do you mind maybe just going around and, and introducing yourself for our, our audience? Sure. I'm Jared Julian. I'm an extensibility engineer with Arista Networks. Beautiful. My name is Boyd Hemphill. I'm the director of infrastructure services at a small firm in Austin called Casasa. We uh, help small banks uh, compete against the large banks. My name is Adam Michael, and I am the director of IT for the College of Architecture at Texas A&M University. Oh, wonderful. And I'm Victoria Blessing, and I am an operations engineer for the College of Architecture at Texas A&M. Oh, nice. Okay. Very good. Hey, thanks for coming, guys. Um, I noticed most of you are, are cool from, from the heat outside, so... Uh, I also heard uh, from, and I think you guys heard as well, just that Chef Comp is coming back to Austin next year. And boy, that's got to be a, it can't be in any small part due to your, um, your involvement in the community here. But, uh, but I heard that, that lesson learned, though, it's going to be in May, not, right. just, not middle of, of uh, Heat Town. So that's. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't take credit. I wish I could. Um, so, but Chef Conf again, I'm, I'm all in. <laughs> yeah, very good. Love you know, it. speaking of uh, having, of sneaking things in, I just, um, did you sneak up on, on Keynote this morning? I, uh, were, you, were you out there on stage doing? No, we're going to do a little sneaking here with the Awesome Chef Awards at the end. Ah, so uh, okay. if you can stick around for the end, we have a surprise for a particularly okay. awesome chef. Well, we won't publish this until after the conference. So, okay, very good. Secret kept. I'll, uh, I'll heckle from the background when you're up there. Very good. Well, nice. Well, yeah, again, thanks for, thanks for coming, guys. Um, um, so a couple of big announcements coming out of the conference, um, you know, around Habitat and um, Automate. And, you know, I've only begun to sort of understand Habitat and coming to realize that there's a fair bit of thought that's been put into that. It's just, you know, they've been working on it for a while, had some bright folks doing it. Um, uh, thoughts from, from you guys? Have you, have you gotten to percolate a little bit on um, Habitat or, or Automate and... Um, what that means to what you're currently doing or how you're currently using your know, chef? So I've attended one of the Habitat sessions and I've done a bit of reading. A couple of my engineers have told me Habitat for the win. It is, of course, in its very early stages, so we won't be going to production with Habitat anytime soon. Um, but I thought that Adam's keynote this morning about immutability as a paradigm really leads me to ask the question, is Habitat competing with Docker? And the reason that I think that is because one of Docker's biggest paradigm shifts is the notion of the immutable infrastructure. And that's exactly where Habitat wants to play. And I'm looking at this as potentially a really great alternative to immutable infrastructure. Not that it's better or worse, just that it's gonna be a really great choice depending on the paradigm that you subscribe to. So I'm extremely excited to see what's gonna be coming next. You know, I tend to agree with that perspective. I don't think necessarily from a um, combative, competitive type you know, play, but, but the, the integration is, is somewhat nuanced. Um, the integration story that's told um, through the tutorials of Habitat is a great one in terms of Habitat you know, building software and putting out containers you know, currently, but also AMIs later and other things. That it's cer there's certainly an integration play, but, but also that notion of um, portability, that notion of infrastructure agnosticism, those are the same real values that, or value adds that you know, tools like Docker and containers um, purport as well. So um, other thoughts on? Well, the, the idea of containerization is you know, the buzzword at the moment and everyone's looking towards using that. And the, the fact that Chef has been able to put out something that competes in that space is, 
is definitely good. It's good to yeah, c- competition breeds. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And like you said, the the resource abstraction layer there is is, is the key. Um, we've all benefited from that in the virtual world. Uh, you know, not having to spend so much time and effort dealing with individual device drivers for for every VM that we put out there, and 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 all of those joys uh, of the past. Being able to get that same benefit for applications is is really a huge win. Uh, we do have to keep in mind that uh, no no one technology is going to solve every problem, but having a set of technologies available to choose from to find the best one for each each challenge is, is a great thing. So I'll talk a little bit about a, an actual specific use case that we have uh, in the College of Architecture. It's one of the things that we do, one of the services we provide our faculty is uh, virtual infrastructure. So we have, over the last couple of years, been fairly successful in moving our faculty out of this paradigm of, I'm going to buy a desktop and I'm going to configure it like a server and slip it under my desk, and that's my web server or my application server. And so now we tell them, stop doing that, or actually we, we tell them, you can't do that because we have somewhat of a bottleneck on the money, right? So, And then we say, here, uh, here's a, a virtual machine that you can use, and we will provide that to you, and we'll make sure the OS is valid and it's patched and things like this. Um, and, and usually we have a chef that we can use to provision those uh, virtual machines, but um, anything that they build on top of that, they it's usually done by graduate students, and they don't have the skill or the time or the inclination to manage everything in that user space up on top in any way that we could maybe put that under chef control. And so if there's a problem, we can't help them rebuild it, we can't help them solve the problem. Um, we've looked at Docker before, but there's a learning curve there that just isn't going to happen for most of our faculty researchers, right, for this type of use case. I only went to that to the first um, overview on Habitat, but I'm kind of interested to see if this is something we might be able to take and then hand to the graduate student in the lab and say, this is a little bit more accessible for you to package your application in this way, and then maybe, because we're already invested in the chef infrastructure, running our, in, our infrastructure, we can run those applications for them in a little bit more reliable way predictable way. Yeah, I think, Adam, between what you just pointed out <clears throat> and what Jared said earlier, that, um, well, and actually to your point about even competition, that um, there are just a ton of different users and a bunch of different organizations, and they have different use cases and different skill sets, and uh, there's a, a lot of problems to be solved, and, and no one singular tool or, or framework is going to do it. And so, um, you know, I think that uh, Habitat stands to, you know, um, really benefit a lot of folks that are already using Chef. Um, they are two significantly di- divergent you know, tools, do have a great integration story, and so um, competitive or not, just uh, great to have um, more tools available for those use cases. So, um, But I'm actually, you know, recognize that I'm in the presence of uh, a couple of speakers here today, which is, which is nice. Um, so both Jira and uh, Victoria, you guys um, have, have given just, I think it was today, you guys just get you know, fresh off your talks. Um, how'd they go? What, what were they about? I, it went well. Um, my, my talk was, the subject was Chef and DevOps for pointy hairs. So um, <laughs> the idea of uh, going through how to explain Chef and DevOps or any technical topic to non-technical individuals or your pointy-haired uh, boss. Yeah, well, geez, Adam, I'm feeling not <laughs> feel uncomfortable here. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, her colleague, I'm going to go ahead and call him out by name since he's not here. He decided not to come to ChefConf and he went fishing instead. <laughs> and so Kevin is the guy who, who named me the pointy-haired boss. But I always tell him when he calls me that, at least I have hair because he doesn't. <laughs> so there you go, Kevin. You should have been here to defend yourself, but you're not. So I don't feel bad. <laughs> I don't have any hair, but I, I meet the litmus test nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, uh, and then, yeah, Jerry, you, you were speaking earlier, right? You're yes. Uh, I, I had the privilege of speaking on NetOps or Net DevOps or DevOps for networking. Um, there's a lot of different terms around this, but when it comes right down to it, there's a lot of infrastructure out there that still hasn't been pulled into the DevOps community. Uh, Storage and networking and 
oftentimes security are some really key pieces. And until we have those included in the DevOps environment, we don't really have our infrastructure as code. We just have pieces and parts. Um, so the more we can do to bring those other environments, those other teams into the, the community. And, 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 and one of the things I love about the DevOps community is the inclusiveness and the willingness to help other people. Um, I, that, that's amazing. And so the more we can reach out to these other teams, bring them in, they can start to take advantage of the consistency, the compliance, the speed, the automation that, that the folks in the, the app and server world have been seeing. As a pointy-haired boss, one of my least favorite activities is talking to my network engineer because I always walk away feeling stupid. Mm. It's a dark art. I don't believe network engineers have souls. They must have sold them to be able to do it. <laughs> And the idea that suddenly we can begin to express the network as code that can be right. read by everyone so that the responsibility can be shared yeah. means that in all seriousness, my network engineer can actually go take time off and not have to carry his phone with him on the beach. And mm -hmm. again, in all seriousness, that's the thing is the pointy haired boss that makes me most happy is that we can humanize the, the practice of network engineering, maybe give them their souls back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, uh, you know, I'll go, I'll, Go back in time about 15 years just for myself um, and it was leading a, a small team of engineers to support about 250 firmware hardware software engineers who had a lot of a very hard requirements around um, networking they were developing video surveillance systems and had needed multicast and DHCP and syslog and DNS services but full route to everything and um, needed it their way and needed it when they, they needed it and so we ended up writing a lot of sort of SDN before that was a, a term um, using even, um, well, I have to think of the language we used. Um, it was, uh, it's a little bit of, uh, not quite so popular, but um, expe expect. expect, yes, thank you, Jim, yes. Um, which worked out really well. Um, point being, um, to Boyd's point, we ended up making a lot of that network infrastructure very visible and writing some automation to let them configure it. the VLANs primarily was the use case um, through just a web-based interface. Um, and having spent um, part of my career at Cisco, I understand there's you know a puppet integration story. I assume there's a Chef one, but Jiro, it's kind of, kind of more you know interested to hear about Arista's you know ability, you know your your hardware's ability to be infrastructure as code, you know to. Well, the the beauty of Arista EOS is it is Linux. Uh, we have a a very common, comfortable CLI for most network users. Um, and we run you know, all of the, the network processes and protocols that you would expect, but at our core, we are Linux. And that means that for us, there's no custom chef agent that needs to be built for EOS. We can run a stock Linux client. Um, that's less work for chef, that's less work for us, that's less work for the community to support and enables you to just get down to the business of, of managing your network faster. Let's take a quick break and get back to the show. You're listening to the Newstack Analyst Podcast, a show about application, development and management at scale. Thanks for joining us. Now let's get back to the show. Well, at Texas A&M, have uh, network configuration come under the, the knife, uh, if I can make that pun? No. <laughs> um, so n networking at Texas A&M is provided by a single centralized group, and then all of us in the uh, distributed IT uh, rely on them to provide our networking for us around campus. I mean, it's a very big campus. Right? We have 65,000 students on campus uh, in College Station. Um, and so necessarily in that type of environment, it's a very complex network. Um, I know that the group is starting to look towards that and move towards that, but 
they're nowhere close to having um, what what I would consider an automated or you know I mean they don't even have switch configurations in uh, version control right now. So, so you know, Boyd, do you think that those uh, those soulless engineers have an aptitude for? You think you could ever convince them to, you know, use a tool like Chef or? The little bit that I understand about networking tells me that you know things like source control, which is sort of a you know table stakes, are, are there. There's a, the notion of rancid and whatnot. So the, the ideas are there, the building blocks. So yeah, when those guys get time to to, to be tutored and then to bring up our game, you know our, our non-network network engineer game towards them, I believe that's the case. But when you dangle the idea of a phoneless vacation in front of them. I think the motivation will be there. <laughs> um, I have a I have a question for you, Jira, which is um, when you're running Ruby on a on, on a network system, those things are highly tuned and, and and you know for speed and what have you, and Ruby's not. <laughs> um, and to say slabs and feel bad and um, and so, well, any any agent, puppet or or chef or whatever, is there a risk of of slowing down my network for a time while that that agent is acting on the box? So there's several factors to consider there. Um, first off, Linux, when built well, is very good at protecting itself. And if something is misbehaving, that can be pushed aside or killed to save the core processes. You have also processes like NICE to be able to ensure that other things have a higher priority. You have control, pa control plane policing to ensure that priority management traffic gets through over and above lower priority things to the control, to the CPU. The other thing is to realize that in most network hardware, in order to gain these enormous speeds that we're able to process packets at, that's pushed down to hardware. So you have a control plane that makes some early decisions, decides what to program into the hardware, but most of the actual forwarding happens in ASICs. So even if your CPU on the box is running at a little higher rate than you'd like, you often can still continue to forward traffic at line rate. Okay. Yep, that makes that makes a lot of sense. <coughs> um, well, you know, interesting that um, not interesting and not not surprising that you guys are all into Chef in some form or fashion. But maybe more interesting is sort of how you came to to Chef, you know, both at Texas A&M, uh, at Casasa, um, what, what led you to select either, you know, that technology versus some others that, you know, maybe I won't name, but um, <laughs> how did that come to be? Well, um, you can explain that better, because at, at that time, I was a student worker and just along for the ride. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> nice. uh, well, I, so the, um, the engineer in her position before uh, she was promoted, he left, and, uh, and so we promoted Victoria up into that position. Mm -hmm. He came into my office one day, and he put a book down on my desk and said, you need to read this. And it was The Phoenix Project uh -huh. by Gene Kim. Yes. And so I said, oh, all right. So I started reading it, and I was hooked immediately. And I think I went to Starbucks late that afternoon. I like, cut out of the office early, and I just finished the book. I read it in one sitting. Oh, and I came back the next day, and I was like, this is amazing, right? So. Um, I bought a copy for all of uh, my employees, our whole team, mm. which it's not a big team, right? So, um, and I said, uh, I gave it to everybody and said, you've got two weeks to read it and we have a meeting and we, we left, we went off site for like the whole afternoon, we just shut down. And so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this book and what it means to how we deliver services and what do we need to do to change so that we can accomplish some of the things that we see in the book. And, um, and that's sort of, kicked it off from there. I think about two weeks after that, we literally had a big meeting in one of our conference rooms where we had index cards with different colors and we did the whole Kanban thing with physical cards and we pasted them up all over the room and that was how we started getting into like rethinking about what are the types of work that we have going on? What's our work in progress? We're literally talking about these concepts in this way and trying to categorize and get a, a handle on the amount of work that we're we're doing, what is our capacity? Before that time, we, I didn't have any way to judge our work capacity. Well, you know, I mean, at one point in time, and, and still in some organizations you see this, we're geeks. We, we get excited about technology mm -hmm. and all the different options that are out there. And sometimes we 
forget, honestly, the reason why we're doing these things. And we get so tied up in the new cool tools, the new things that we can do, and we forget to stop back up, just like they were talking about in the keynotes, and remind ourselves, why are we doing this? We're doing this because there's a business problem that needs to be solved. We're doing this to ship an idea. And if we're doing something that is not in line with enabling the shipping of that idea or simply making business processes better for the people that are working there, then we're just getting in the way. We're wasting energy. So to echo both what Jared and Adam were saying, um, I can tell almost identical story to Adam about how I came to uh, the Phoenix Project. Um, and uh, it was actually the first ChefConf that the book became, um, really? came to my notice, yeah. Um, and then to, to tie that to what Jared was saying, the Phoenix Project is, in Gene Kim's own words, a pretty much a ripoff of a book called The Goal by yeah. Eliyahu Goldrat. Mm -hmm. So for all those of you who are listening who are thinking, ooh, must read The Phoenix Project, please do. And then read the goal, because the salient fact in the goal is the goal of your company is not to make good software, <laughs> it's to make money. And if what you're doing isn't tied to that goal, um, you're probably not doing the right thing, as Jared pointed out. So um, the Phoenix Project, the goal. And if you're really into it, then look at It's Not Luck, which is the sequel to the goal. So there was no, uh, just in, in accordance with your story, Adam, no... Um uh, sort of by chance happening that you guys pivoted and, and brought in you know, new tools. It was an inspired moment. I mean, it, it, was it was certainly purposeful, right? And, and, but I would say that it was, at some point it became a top-down directive, right? I said, we're going to do this. Let's, and the pointy hair stepped in. Right, the pointy hair, right. But <laughs> it was an organic movement because it was one of my engineers, and he had already given the book to some of his peers, and uh, he'd already been sort of evangelizing, we should change the way we do these things in this way. So when I came in and he sort of uh, transferred that, that spark to me, right? Everyone was primed and ready to do this. I mean, there were a few people that we had to pull along for the ride, but for the most part, right? Yeah. I, I completely agree with what you said though, right? I mean, the, one of the things that we had to do was get our individual groups to stop defining success for themselves as their piece of that puzzle, right? So, oh, I wrote my code, I'm done. No, you're not. It's not done if there's not a deliverable to the customer. That's when you're done. Everything else is simply a piece, right? It doesn't matter how well you did that piece if your colleague can't deliver on his part and the customer doesn't have what they need. Then you've both failed. So expanding the view of what their team is to be that higher level and the goal being here's this final end product that I can deliver to the customer that I think was the biggest takeaway that we had from this entire model shift right it was cultural much more than it was technological right we we ha you have to you have to recognize that it's a shared responsibility yeah to reach to reach that end goal not just yeah your little piece oh that's it no more for me but it's a shared responsibility to reach that end goal. So, to to put a more uh, to put a finer point on that, um, in a previous life, I was in an organization where we would provide custom websites to companies who were selling drugs. Uh, so they would roll out a new drug and they want a custom website. So we would have six weeks to build a custom website. And after uh, reconfiguring some of our processes, what we learned is that the creative team was taking all six weeks and they were done and they were on time, which is why we constantly failed because just delivering the creative <laughs> did not mean the website was delivered so <laughs> yeah, sounds like what ops says about dev <laughs> <laughs> well that, that ultimately that um as the devops manager there i hated that title um <laughs> what i did was i just said hey chef hmm okay so we delivered on the very first day of the project the production infrastructure to run that website on and then we were done and then we went looking for why things weren't getting done after that because we had plenty of time because we knew we didn't have any work <laughs> left to do. Yeah. So we built delivery pipelines and, and, and things of that nature because Chef allowed us to become not the end of the train where we were always late and being yelled at. Right. So once I got us out of that, we were in good shape. But really the key is, like you all were saying, like Adam and, and um, Victoria were saying, pardon me, um, 
it's not that your piece is done in the deadline. It's that your piece is done with enough time for every other piece on the critical yeah. path to get done as well. I think that um, the single most valuable insight I got out of the Phoenix project, and which it comes straight out of this concept of uh, lean manufacturing, right, is that an optimization at any point in your uh, workflow that is not at the bottleneck is illusory. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how effective your developers get. It doesn't matter how tightly you're on that two week sprint timeline. If the bottleneck is somewhere else and you're not optimizing the bottleneck, it's useless. It's, it's an illusion. If the code is sitting in source control, it's not in production. <laughs> and it's right. called production because it makes you money. It produces your revenue. <laughs> and, and likewise, um, as the CIO of Alaska Airlines said yesterday, code without context yes. is meaningless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've got to understand where your particular job fits in to the overall process. And yeah, Adam probably harped on that a uh, quite a bit through his storytelling and his keynotes as well. Just really, really context and providing that understanding to engineers that are trying to build. So very good. Well, you know, um, speaking of that, of stories, um, boy, did we get your story about just the, the choice of technology around Chef that that's happening at um, Casasa and why that is? So at Casasa, we do have configuration management. However, um, it's, it's suffered quite a bit of bit rot. Um, I brought in engineers to support that specific system. Um, but the innovation pace at Chef is so far advanced yeah. that uh, two of my engineers came to me and said, I really think we should consider Chef. Well, as a, a dyed-in-the-wool chef guy you know, from five years ago, um, I thought, okay, great, go, go, go build me a business case. And they did. Um, I would say that the biggest draw to us uh, is compliance um, because we work in the banking industry and we are often uh, audited nearly at FFIEC bank levels. Um, we, need to do a, we need to improve our compliance game on a daily basis. Things like inspect, chef compliance, visibility, and workflow are all things that are going to make that easy and are built into the tooling that we're already planning to use. We can't get that with any other configuration management system, and they can't build it within two years. And even if they could, it's going to be brand new, and I'm not going to trust it. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather start with chef. Very good. Makes, makes perfect sense. Um, well, I want to thank you guys for your for your time and joining. It's uh, been a great conversation. Um, we're just tickled to have a couple of speakers here as well. So you guys are you guys are making waves and, and sharing your stories. So thanks for coming today, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You are listening to the Newstack Analyst Podcast, a show about application development and management at scale. Thanks again, and I hope to see you back at the show. Bye-bye.